Hello and welcome to the Scottish Clans. I'm Clint. Thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to be talking about the Reedswire Fray and the Rutherfords, the Rutherford clan, the Rutherford family, writing name, whatever you prefer. Before I get into that, let me give a shout out to my sponsor, USA Kilts. They make awesome kilts. They make a lot of other stuff besides kilts, though. They make anything really that you would ever want to put on yourself to express your pride in your Scottish heritage specifically, or your even more specifically, your clan heritage, but even more gen- generally, your Celtic heritage, because they've got some Irish and some Welsh and some other stuff in there too. So go check them out at usakilts.com. Awesome products, great customer service. And uh, I think you're going to, I don't think you'll be disappointed with anything that you get from there. Also, their YouTube channel is called Celtic. USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions, and they have a ton of content on there, and it's very, they're very good at guessing what, especially if you're a a kilt wearer, they're very good at guessing questions that you have about wearing it. Having been myself only a kilt wearer for a relatively short period of time, I found their content very helpful, but they also have things on Scottish culture and heritage and history, and so I really encourage you to go check them out on their YouTube channel as well. All right, so... Let me tell you about a story called the Reed's Wire Fray. It takes place in the Middle March. I think that when we come to the borders of Scotland, the West March is the most, what would be the right word? Famous? Infamous? Notorious? Because you have groups there like like uh, the Armstrongs, the Elliots, the Johnstons. The, you have all these really exciting, uh, dynamic, historical, like it's just stories. They're really just good stories. They're just good stories that I love to learn about. I really think that the Scottish borders, I've said this before and I'll probably end up saying it again. I really think that they, the, the Highlands don't have anything that's way better than the history that the cool history that you can find on the borders and i'm not taking anything from the highlands you guys know that i'm neck deep in cool highland history but i think that i only say this because i think the borders take a back seat to the highlands and i really think that for the person who especially if your ancestry comes more from the border region and and you're like the highlands highlanders have all the cool history no, they don't. They have a lot of awesome history. Yes, they do. But the borders have awesome history too. And if you get into it, I don't think you'll be disappointed. The Reedswire Fray that I'm going to address today was a conflict that took place in 1575. And as such, it made it the, um, it made it the last conflict, the last actual battle between England and Scotland. And I think you're in your head, you're going to be thinking, well, no, there's later stuff in that in the 1700s and you had the War of the Three Kingdoms. And and I don't really think that those count. I think the reason why it's stating that that this is the last battle between the two kingdoms is because in all those other ones that you're probably thinking of in the 16 and first half of the 1700s, it really wasn't one nation against another. It was definitely sides. You know, even with the Jacobite Rebellion, you had the Jacobites, but it wasn't only Scots that were part of that rebellion. And it wasn't all of Scotland that was on the Jacobite side. There was definitely a lot of Scots who did not, who were not sympathetic with the Stuart cause and sided with the Hanover. So the, anyway, that that kind of complexity gets in the rest of it. And so I, you strip that all away. And I think you're left with the Battle of Reedswire. And it took place on the 7th of July, which was actually my due date. I just, just looked down and saw that. I realized that. That's when I was supposed to be born. I wasn't yet then, but uh, 17, or 7, 7 of July... 1575. And let's set the stage for what happened here. So the, the, the main clan that I'm focusing on here are the Rutherfords. They were a... Uh, you guys, and you, you, I've gone at length on clans versus not clans. And, and I was just listening to, actually, a... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a little shout out here. There's a YouTube channel called The Reavers Road. And this gentleman who's running this here, he is pointing out that, hey, look, the guys along the border, they're not clans. Clans is a highland. It's a Gaelic concept. Uh, Gaelic would be a more accurate statement because there are Gales in the lowlands too for a long time. 
he said it's a Gallic concept and we would not never have on the borders they would have never used and that's accurate okay so i just want to be sympathetic toward this other side i've made the argument that hey look it looks walks like a duck quacks like a duck it's probably a duck regardless of what word you use for it and so to justify using the word clan to describe these lowland kindreds but however historically this gentleman's right they um along the border the word clan probably would not have been used and, and writing names surnames uh families would have been used there instead of a chief they would have a headsman a head a head man basically so um yeah I, i'm not going to get too caught up on that today i'm not going to dive into that too much but the rutherfords were the kindred I, I i like to use the word kindred the scholars like to use that word and they throw it around for both highland and lowland stuff and and it and we're and it indicates a kin based society, which I think is at the at the core of this podcast for sure, and and at the core of the topic that we cover. So um, the Rutherfords, I looked them up. I wanted to learn some history about them, and I looked at the, I looked at the Wikipedia page for them. And if you only follow the Wikipedia page, it, it's gonna. So here's this, it brings me to something, a, a bigger concept as I study the origins of different clans. Because I want to know what group they came out of. I don't know why that's important to me. It just is. It doesn't, I may be in the big picture, it doesn't matter at all. But are they a Norman clan? Are they a Gallic clan? At, on the Wikipedia page, it really, it gives like a few traditional origins of the clan, which are clearly fables. But then it gets down to recorded origins and it just starts, boom, here's the first guy in Scotland that's on the record. And so here's, and it doesn't give you like a real connection to where they come out of, what group do they come out of. And a lot of the times in my, I've got this theory running and I originally had it about the Rutherfords, but then I, I found more information and I had to discard it about them specifically. But for a lot of kindreds, we don't have we have their their first guy on their on in their of that surname on record and we we don't we, we don't have really anything that ties him back to the origins when they go into the linguistic origin of the name okay maybe it's maybe the ling linguistic origin was gallic or maybe it was um british when i asked when i say british i specifically mean cuz i had somebody ask about 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 that recently, we're speaking specifically of the native P Celtic branch of the Celtic family, or Brythonic, is another more academic term for the so so as opposed to Q Celtic or Goidelic, which would be your Scots Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Manx. So more related to Welsh, and and so I look at where these traditional groups of people were historically. Now, the kingdom of Strathclyde and speakers of this Cumbric language that would have been spoken in Strathclyde in this kingdom, that would have been the dominant language. And it went from the Clyde Firth and a little bit farther north, actually, there's a, there's a rock north of Loch Lomond called Clachnumbreton. I think that's what... I think that's what it's called. In Gaelic, it means rock of the Britons. And they think that may be a boundary marker for the very northern extent of the Strathclyde Britons. And but then that kingdom went south across what's now the Scottish English border. And and that would have been the language there predominantly would have been a language similar to what would evolve into Welsh. So and so and, and then on farther east than that in the lowlands, you would have the Angles of, of Northumbria, historically speaking. And so in these cases, like the Rutherfords, they don't have a clear connection on the Wikipedia page. And I'm like, well, maybe in that gap, uh, maybe they were whatever was local. So in this case, it would be maybe right on the border of what would have been Northumbria or Strathclyde. And so they would either have been Strathclyde Britons or Angles of Northumbria. And you can get into deeper conversations about like the Angles weren't always there. It was an elite who came in and dominated the local Brit Britons who had just spoke, spoken a P-Celtic language and they changed languages and there's DNA stuff on that. I'm not going to get too far into that, but um, I did actually found something more specific on the Rutherfords that actually lead me into, that led me in kind of down a rabbit hole of study for the past couple of weeks. And that is about the, the Rutherford. So I went to their actual, their, their clanrutherford.org is their, website 
And they have a lot of history. I always brag about the Campbells have a really good online presence. They're they're the Clan Campbell Society of North America. So ccsna.org has some awesome history on it, like really, really well done stuff. Lots of content there. The the Rutherfords do are doing okay. I, I would say that I they they gave me plenty to chew on. And that led me into other stuff that I found on the, the St. Andrews University, University of St. Andrews, I can't remember which, and a writer on that. And that might produce content for future episodes. But the Rutherfords actually go back to Flemish orient, origins. And so I learned a lot about the Flemish and their introduction that was on my radar as far as I kind of all lumped them in with the Bretons into the Norman conquest of England that then were invited up into Scotland. But they're distinct from the Normans. Definitely. It goes back to Flanders and to the Arambald family there. Anyway, I'm not going to get too far down that rabbit hole, but I just want to let you know that this Flemish movement in produced, I don't know if genetically it was a huge influence on the gene pool in Scotland, but it did produce some very influential kindreds specifically. So here are the Rutherfords, the Sutherlands, the Douglases, the Innises, the Murrays, and others of more, uh, you know, lesser, lesser influential kindreds, but still, um, they, the Flemish did well for themselves in Scotland. All right, so let's actually get to the raid on Reed's Wire. So, oh, and by the way, I'd like to thank that, uh, the Reavers Road channel for helping me. Sometimes I just see a, a proper noun and I don't know how to pronounce it. I've only seen it written and I, so I, uh, I try to look it up on YouTube. And so that's where I found it. Before I jump into the, the actual battle here, USA Kilts, go to usakilts.com if you want awesome awesome products. Well done products. Even their kilt pin that I got from them recently. I got a kilt pin. So I, I like to represent the Welsh side of the family as well as like, because you're very overtly being Scottish with your kilt. But I like to put in little subtle hints, subtle little things in there as a shout out to, because the Edwardses are Welsh. We're Welsh. We're American now, USA. But but uh, that's where we came from. And I'm I'm really proud of that Welsh heritage too. And so I got a kilt pin that's got the Welsh dragon on it. And I thought I was going to get some super cheap, light little thing, just because that's what the picture looked like. But it's actually a substantial, like, once again, just good quality stuff. And so now that's my kilt pin. So go on there, get awesome products, great customer service. Um, I, I don't think you'll be disappointed with what you find there. The uh, And then go to their YouTube channel. Go to your YouTube channel, check them out, USA Kilts and Celtic Traditions. And they've got tons of content to run around with on there. All right, guys, the Battle of the, the Reed's Wire fray, the Battle of Reed's Wire, the, Reed's, the Raid of Reed's Wire, a lot of different names. 7 July, 1575. Um, so there's the, the, the border between England and Scott was so crazy, so lawless, so rough. So there was this, com this coordinated effort this between um, a cooperative effort between Scotland and England to set up a system along the border where there could be something, some kind of semblance of justice, order, law. So they set up the system of marches. And both the English and the Scottish had a system. So they had the, both of them had their own respective East, Middle, and West March. March is just a border. It means borders, a border country. You have the Welsh marches, and that was the frontier country between the Norman controlled area and the, and the native Welsh controlled areas. So same same word here. But so you had the east, middle, and west marches. Each of those marches on both sides had a march warden. And so that would make a total of six, wouldn't it? At any given time, theoretically, right? History is messier than that. It's not as tidy, but theoretically at any time you'd have six march wardens. And they would have these days called truce days where they would get together and they'd just settle stuff. And probably a lot of these truce days went off without a hitch. They met together, people got, they just worked out whatever beef they had. But we have these truce days sometimes turned into a hot mess. And that's what actually happened on the, the day where the, the Reed's Wire fray happened. They got together and part of the business of the day was the, where the Scots were demanding justice for a, 
a, an Englishman who had his his name the the so there's two different versions of this actually several you can find many different versions of this story online and all of them choose to include different different details um, I'm just going to read right off of the the Wikipedia version of this which like I said I already pointed out the the flaw in the Wikipedia origin story for the Rutherfords huge failure that Flemish element should be in there but this is good for what it's for. So one of the topics discussed during this meeting, this truce day, was an Englishman who had stolen some items from a Scotsman and who was supposedly in Forster's custody. John Forster was the English middle March warden. And John Carmichael was the Scottish March warden for the for the middle March. And so Carmichael brings up the forcer, hey, you've got a guy in your custody that's been stealing stuff from our guys, and we want justice. Now, the Englishman, the English march warden, Forster, he says, actually, this guy had taken, quote unquote, leg bail, meaning he hightailed it out. And we don't have him. Now, the Scots said, we don't believe you. We believe you've got him and you're just not, you're just holding out on us to which the English took great offense. Super offended that the Scots would claim that they would not be Justin. And they lost their tempers and started shooting arrows into Scots, started killing people. And the Scots fall back. And they're, they're in retreat and the English are chasing them down. I guess demanding their honor be repaid or something. However, there was a group coming from Jedburgh, which I had to look that up on, <laughs> on YouTube as well pronunciation, Jedburgh versus Jedburgh. Um, there was a group coming from Jedburgh. Now, Jedburgh, if you look on a Scottish clan map, and there's a one that we've all looked at before, is right on the border between the Rutherford and Kerr territory. By the way, I did get, you know who you are out there. I got your request for the Kerr history. Um, so I've looked into that a little bit. So just know, but Jedbro is right there. This force that's coming from Jedbro, who is who are they? They're trying to get there for the truce day. They they're I mean they're everywhere they go they're ready to fight because they live on the borders. But the intent was just attend a truce day. But they were late. But what do they find is this group of people hightailing it back and pursuing English force, trying and shooting arrows at them, and and there's there's this huge commotion. And so you get this group from Jedbra. And now the key thing here with the Rutherford history is that they were led by the the they're led by the Rutherfords. Now, was the whole force Rutherfords? Probably not. But I'm gonna flip over to the Rutherford Wikipedia page because they actually include some details in here that the other stuff didn't include. The uh they have Thomas Rutherford, the Black Laird of Edgerston. Okay, so the, the um, Scots were taken by surprise. They're driven backward. So you have these men from Jedburgh led by Rutherfords who jump in here right in the nick of time, completely flip the battle, and start killing Englishmen. Englishmen are trying to retreat, go back, and it was the Rutherfords that saved the day. Was the force that the Rutherfords led completely Rutherfords? Probably not. But you do have several branches of them representative. And that's one of the things we look for when we look for a clan is this broader kindred than just a, this one dude and his family, however high his rank was. It's got to be broader than him and his his sons. But you have you have several different positions of of Rutherford's um, jumping down and jumping into this, turning the tide of the battle. It happened at Reed's Wire. And so it's called the Reed's Wire Fray. The Scots win. So the Scots win. <laughs> this is kind of funny about this. The Scots win the last for sure battle between England and Scotland. That's kind of funny, I think, because culture, they lost big. <laughs> and, and as soon as, and we even see that like, as soon as James VI inherited the English throne, he was out. It was like a promotion because England was such a richer country. And so he moves his whole court down to London. And I don't know, it just seems like a lot of things go the way of the English, which, and I have a ton of English blood too. So I shouldn't, uh, 
but this is a Scottish history <laughs> podcast. But the Scots win the last the last official battle between England and Scotland. And thanks to the Rutherfords. The Rutherfords are right there. They were the difference. The Scots were in retreat, getting their butts handed to them. And you have the Rutherfords and other people from Jedburgh come on the scene, tip the ties of the battle, push the English out. And they actually captured some significant English prisoners. Um, specifically John Forster, the English March warden for that, for that, for the, for the middle March, I'm assuming. And, and among others, high profile prisoners they took. Now the Earl of Morton, who was a Douglas, he was the regent. James VI at this time was young. And so he was the regent. He had control of Scott. He was pretty much running in the place of the king, the affairs of the kingdom. And he was sensitive to the political situation between Stuart, Scotland, and Queen Elizabeth's England. Neither one of Scotland nor Queen Elizabeth wanted any, they didn't want this to erupt into some whole national conflict. So the prisoners were treated very well. In fact, the Earl of Morton said, we're just keeping them for safekeeping because they, they, they killed people. And so they're going to be people out there seeking revenge. And so we're going to, we're going to keep them safe. They eventually turned them over back to the, the English. The English actually took a prisoner I don't, it, in one of the accounts, it names him. I'll include some links below. I mean, this is not like super academic, so I'm not getting wrapped around the axle here about sources and that, but the uh, English had taken at least one Scottish prisoner, but in there, in there, as they tried him, and it looks like they gave him an honest trial because it was clear to them that Forster began unprovoked violence. Like there was no call for him to start killing Scots. And so they let this guy go. Anyway, that's how it turned out. Uh, they saved, they, they managed to avoid an international conflict, but Scotland did win the last official battle between England and Scotland. I mean, you that's a little blown out of proportion, maybe. Maybe, I mean, it was these very localized people, but it was very, it was drawn, the, the conflict was drawn very clearly along Scottish and English lines. And maybe that's why they say this is the last one. I don't know. You can decide whether it counts or whether it doesn't count, or whether there is another one later than this that actually counts. But this is the story of the Reed's Wire Fray. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I am sporting my little shout out to Michael McFarland at uh, the, he's got the Celtic Jackalope tent at all the the Scottish festivals and Highland Games and stuff. And I got this T-shirt out of his. So from my McFarland ancestors, the back of it's super cool. I'm not going to show it to you, but um, it says. The McFarland Cattle Company, best of the Cahoon herd, <laughs> which little head nod there to the McFarland rating tendencies, cattle rating tendencies. But um, yeah, so guys, just a little, just a little update. I am still working on, I, I'm making progress on providing some free content, some actually tangible free content or digital, you, however you want to say that, but free content in addition to all the information that I'm putting out with the podcast. I've got a I've got a website set up scottish-clans.com and I'm setting it up so I'm now starting to post guys I've been at this for a long time trying to um just little mental projects of mine that, that have helped me and I've actually made products of them and now I'm trying to convert them over to digestible forms and hand them over so you guys can access them too but those will be available uh, I think I've got one ready for you right now I have to do some more like testing of it does this is that I set it up right so you can test it out yourself let me know if it didn't work but it's at scottish-clans.com forward slash 1587 1587 and I've got the the 1587 Act of Parliament that sometimes is called the role of the clans. And it, you can go on there. And I actually, I think I'm going to do a an episode about that in the future. But got great things coming. Subscribe, follow whatever this platform that you're listening to this is on. Share it with your friends. And until next time, Marshan Leiv and Drasta.